Have you ever had a dream that that you um you had you 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 could you do you you want you you could do so you you do you could you you want you want him to do you so much you could do anything? Well, I have now. Today's game is a walking sim that decides to go down the meta dream route by having us watch a commercial for a game inside of a dream that is linked to a game that we're playing on a laptop that we're using inside of a game. My name is Groudon and I'm reviewing Steam games in alphabetical order to find the hidden gems in the piles of garbage, and today's game is Minus 256. Link start. <laughs> Minus 256 now holds the title of trippiest experience in this series, at least so far. And yes, that includes the opening sequence of Member the Alamo. This game is a walking simulator with a striking visual style that is reminiscent of early PS1 3D graphics, where they've taken higher resolution objects and pixelated them to lower the resolution and the file size. The effect is most noticeable when looking at the clothing of the various characters in the game, which I can only best describe as a dot matrix style. This is combined with vaporwave style aesthetics, and I must admit, I wasn't expecting to see this style again so soon after seeing it in Reflected. There are also puzzle and horror elements present in Minus 256, but rest assured, there aren't any jump scares. Oh, yep, those doors good. Let's, we can go back now. Underneath the cheerful and bright exterior of the vigils, there are some much darker undertones. So let's set the scene for how we actually get to this world because there is a plot here albeit a somewhat purposefully obtuse and vague one this game is definitely an art project that encourages you to draw your own conclusions and interpretation of events as you'll come to see another thing that i want to address early is the music the music used in minus 256 is overall quite lovely and fitting for the various environments I say this because the music does change for each area that you're in, providing some welcome variety. However, the music tracks used are not original compositions. If I were to play them, this video would be demonetized. How do I know this? Well, because it happened to my live stream. So while I won't be playing the music here, you can find the VOD on my channel and listen to it there if you're so inclined. The game begins with us looking at a laptop screen, which may not be the most engaging opening sequence ever, but using the laptop itself is surprisingly intuitive, and a lot of the small things that I wouldn't normally expect to work, do. For example, you can drag the windows around freely, and even change the wallpaper between several equally liminal and abstract options. The Rat Wizard is my favourite. There's something special about the graphical style that reminds me of the early 2000s CGI RuneScape wallpapers, and I'm here for that. The first thing we have access to is the in-game mailbox, which in a lovely touch will pull through your Steam ID and insert it into the game. By reading through the emails, we can deduce that we're playing as someone who is either a content creator or blogger of some description, and a concerned fan has reached out as they're worried about us not uploading anything recently. So they've sent over a copy of what is rumoured to be a cursed game that has been circulating, as ghost stories and creepypastas usually do. After downloading the file, we're presented with some terms of service that are in an unreadable language and an unlabeled .exe file that immediately makes me think I'm about to install a virus. Thankfully, it's not being installed on my actual PC, so we go ahead and boot up the game. In the launcher window, we're given a bit of backstory telling us that we've been hired in the game world to perform some significant and insignificant tasks. Wonderful, that sounds like every game ever. I should also mention here that the settings menu is the actual settings menu for the game itself and includes a rat mode. I turned this on to test it, and other than making things larger and blurrier, I have no idea what it does. So we hit connect, and after a few moments of loading, we're transported in true anime isekai fashion, minus the truck, into the world of the game, within a game. Here we meet our first in-game character, none of which are named. So as is the fashion for this channel, they will now be called Larry. As a side note, I'm considering adding a couple of membership tiers to the channel. A basic level would get your name in the end credits, and a higher level would get an in-game character named after you for a video. Let me know in the comments if this sounds interesting to you. Larry lays out some lovely lore for us, explaining that we are a member of the hotel staff, replacing someone that was dealt with for being uncooperative. We're handed a clipboard with some tasks to complete, and sent off to explore and fulfil our duties, the first of which are in the nearby restaurant. 
Before we head there though, it's time for a little exploring. Starting with Larry's office, there's a nice amount of detail here, from the furnishings to the objects on and around the desk. One small complaint I have is that the screens that explain the basic controls, as welcome as they are, should not be located in a position that the player cannot see when starting the game. Yes, most people know that moving the mouse will move the camera, but a tutorial should be designed assuming that your player has never picked up a video game before in their life. With some exceptions, as there are games that are marketed at experienced players, but if you want your game to be accessible, then it needs to be as simple and obvious as possible, yet also optional so that it doesn't frustrate experienced players. A simple solution here would be having the instructions on a placard on Larry's desk. Moving on, we head out into the lobby, which is quite expansive with plenty to discover. It's immediately noticeable that most of the NPCs don't have any physical features, and this is actually explained in the game. After chatting to a few of the hotel staff, one will mention that visitors can't be seen by the staff in order to protect their anonymity, a neat idea in terms of both a narrative concept and a way to get around having to spend a lot of dev time making models for every single person. But it does raise the question of why we are a staff member and not a visitor. Moving further along, here are a few of the highlights you'll find in the lobby. A giant screen showing a fictional live streamer, a series of display cabinets with dancing gummy bears, and a lounge with a TV that plays a series of adverts that seem to show snippets from other games or animated shows. I have no idea where these are pulled from. They could be side projects of the dev or snippets taken from other media on the internet. Given that the rat in the wizard hat from the laptop background in the opening shows up, I'm inclined to believe that some of the clips are from the creator. The first task we need to complete is in the restaurant, so now that we're horrendously late for our first shift, let's head on over. We're tasked with wiping down tables and then setting them up for the next round of guests. Easy enough. The supplies you'll need are in the kitchen, and it's here that you'll see the chefs dealing with quite a large piece of meat. They'll need to beat this meat rather vigorously before it can be cooked. Seriously though, the way they are standing around it with their knives out made me wonder if I was about to go into a turn-based battle by approaching. As fun as that would have been, sadly it's not the case. You'll need to go around all of the tables three times, as you can only carry one thing at a time. Once everything is cleaned up and set, it's off to the next task in the garden. Sounds lovely, right? Well, kind of. This is the Bloodstained Garden. Yeah, it gets a bit dark pretty quickly. It's a name that wouldn't be out of place in a Dark Souls or Castlevania game. The area itself is quite lovely at first glance, but upon closer inspection, you'll notice the vials of blood that are feeding every piece of flora. There's even a group taking selfies in front of some giant glass containers of blood with a tube that extends up and along the ceiling from there. And if you look even more closely, you'll notice this person hiding next to a topiary. Wait, my bad. That's not a person, that's definitely an ordinary topiary. In the Bloodstained Garden, we're tasked with using Head, a dog-like robotic vacuum cleaner, to lick up puddles of blood. That is definitely a new sentence. Doing this requires rapidly clicking the puddle until it's been sucked up by Head, and this is where my first real gripe is. And it's a classic gameplay mistake to make. Spam clicking on things is okay in short bursts, but it should be justified. The final puddle especially requires 15 seconds of constant clicking to remove it. Just let me click and hold until it's gone. You can make me wait the same amount of time, that's fine, but don't give me RSI. Once we've cleaned up all of the puddles, we return Head back to his body and the job is done. The Bloodstained Garden is now the garden with a bit of blood in it. The final task involves cleaning up after a guest who recently vacated their hotel room and left some belongings behind. And given the nature of the belongings, I can't say I blame them. You'll see what I mean in a second. This is actually set up rather well, even though I overlooked it when I was playing through. There are two rooms, one which is already cleaned and the other that needs to be tidied. This is basically a spot the difference puzzle between the two rooms to identify things that are out of place, like this giant conical flask of blood or this hammer, or this voodoo doll, or this fish. And this is one aspect of Minus 256 that I love. There is so much world building that happens through exploration, the environment, and the things that you stumble into as part of the story. We now know for sure that something shady is happening behind the scenes, but we don't have enough plot threads to figure out what exactly is going on just yet. 
all three tasks complete, we can now return to the manager, Larry, for our next instructions. And as it so happens, Larry does indeed have one more task for us. Well, kind of. He'd like us to go and assist any staff members that are in need of help. Now, we're over halfway through the game and things are about to take a turn. So, if this has piqued your curiosity so far, here's my advice. Stop the video and go play it. Minus 256 is completely free, so you can go and experience the rest of the game and then come back to this. For everyone still here, there is a time code on screen if you want to skip to the verdict. Otherwise, you can keep watching and see where this goes. Still here? All right, let's press on. One of the staff at the central reception desk is still waiting for their replacement to arrive so that they can end their shift. They ask you to check the staff room, so it's back to Larry to get a keycard and then in we go. Chatting to the two staff inside, it appears that neither of them are who we're looking for, but they're not sure where he is either. So it's time to do some investigating. Thanks to what is either an incredibly lax or incredibly authoritarian rule, all of the lockers are unlocked, making them errs. Moving right along, here are some of the highlights from opening the lockers. An entire floor lamp for when you need a moment of inspiration. An emergency supply of toilet paper and tissues. A plastic chair with a reserve sign just so everyone knows it's theirs. Ducks. Just ducks. The most important locker is this one, filled with post-it notes. By moving them out of the way, you'll uncover one with a somewhat cryptic message. As a side note, there's actually nothing in the game that indicates you can open the locker. Usually the cursor changes to a hand icon to indicate that something can be interacted with, but that's not the case for the lockers. I think this is a simple oversight, but it's one that could cause a player to be confused for a while. As there's nothing else to uncover, we head back to the staff at the reception desk and then back to Larry. But Larry is gone. Well, what better time to continue our snooping? Taking a look at Larry's PC, we see a series of slides that appear to show the process by which the consciousness of a sleeping person is uploaded, passing through a series of doors, and then integrated with a suit, which is then worn by a member of the robotic staff. And yes, we are currently using a computer inside of a game that happens to be played in a laptop that is inside of a game. It then goes on to show what happens if a robot tries to escape. In short, they are shot, which causes a reset and memory loss. So although it seems that we only just arrived here, we truly don't know how many times we've already been reset. Who knows how long we've been asleep? What we do know is that the previously inaccessible door behind us is now open. Opening the door, we find a lift that has only two floors, minus 255 and minus 256. Heading down, we're greeted with an immediate tone change. Everything is dark and we can barely see in front of us. Down here, you'll find a door locked with an access panel. To the right is a torch, and to the left is Larry's corpse. Whatever is down here is definitely not friendly. We take Larry's hand, and using that and the post-it note from earlier, we're able to get into the storage room, which is filled with racks upon racks of suits. As you move about, you'll hear the sounds of footsteps that change pace at random, objects being pushed onto the floor and menacing laughter. I will mention again that there are no jump scares, and in fact, you cannot even die here. Even so, it all works marvellously to create a truly unsettling mood, completely shifting the tone of the game. And unfortunately, this is also the weakest part of the game for several reasons. The first is that there is a barcode scanner just to the left of the entrance of this room. I missed this the first time and had to reload the game to find it. Secondly, if you move too far, you'll be teleported back, but it's not always to the exact same location. It varies, which causes a real sense of disorientation. This may not have been a bad thing were it not for the fact that you need to trigger the teleport in order to progress. There are three different tiles on the ground, but the game doesn't tell you the core mechanic unless you picked up the scanner. If you did, you'll find a staff member who gives you a cryptic hint. The closer you get to the place, the more you'll feel something. Focus. One of the three tiles will trigger a heartbeat sound after standing still for a moment. You need to move in the direction of the heartbeat until you're teleported, and then find the new tile that triggers the heartbeat. Using the scanner will reveal what appear to be coordinates, but unfortunately, without any knowledge of what the target coordinate is, this is rendered useless. 
It's entirely possible I missed a clue that gives you this information, but thankfully this maze can be solved without it. Follow the heartbeat sound enough times and eventually you'll find what you're looking for. And what you find is a glowing, corrupted suit. You're taken to a realm of doors where you'll wander along a path until you eventually pass through one into... Well, this is the part where I really lost what was going on. As far as I can tell, the giant glowing white figure is a program that isn't part of the main infrastructure of the game, but was put here to help care for lost souls like myself. She presents us with a few questions and eventually offers to send us back to our body. Again, at least as far as I could tell. If you've been paying attention, you may have spotted the odd typo or grammatical error in the text. For the most part, it doesn't impact the game. But here, there are several sentences that just don't work, and you'll have to make some assumptions about what they're trying to say. And this means you're both pulled out of the experience and also more confused by an already purposefully confusing plot. After exhausting all the dialogue options and my patience for obtuse storytelling, we're finally returned to our body in the real world. Waking up, we're able to see our reflection and where our face should be is just a jumbled mess. We may have escaped that world, but at what cost? It seems that part of our sense of self, our identity, was left behind when we escaped. We're not able to get up and explore, but we can interact with the laptop. And if you were to try reconnecting to the game, it will fail as your user ID is now blocked. And that's it. That's the end of the game. A final small touch that I appreciated is that when you open the mailbox again, there is an additional message that just reads, why did you run away? But more importantly, the advert that was recommending the dolphin mailbox at the beginning of the game has been replaced with a new advert for potato mailbox, claiming that the dolphin mailbox is a scam. Minus 256 is a tricky one to provide a rating for. On the one hand, the world building, art style and narrative premise are all fantastic. I'd happily explore more of the hotel, performing menial tasks and gradually learning about the dark secrets behind the scenes. On the other hand, that's not how the game goes, and instead we have a second half that flops in some pretty major ways, completely pulling the player out of the experience with frustrating puzzle design and nigh incomprehensible storytelling. And it's all such a shame because it makes it feel like a game in two halves. I wish the game had actually taken a bit more time before trying to do a narrative rug pull, and that it spent more time polishing the second half of the game. Imagine this. You meet a character who appears to be panicking, looking for a way out of the hotel, convinced that the manager is hiding something. Their paranoia increases gradually as you complete tasks in the hotel, and each set of tasks you complete unlocks a new area, such as a cocktail lounge, a casino, or even a pool. Eventually you return and your friend has completely changed. The paranoia is gone and replaced with a general dismissiveness and obedience. They don't remember who you are. You find their locker and search through their belongings for clues. You find a hotel guest that knows more than they should and you learn that the bodies belonging to the hotel staff are transported to a facility where they are kept on life support, their bodies continuously drained of blood. And this isn't a game. You are simply seeing everything through a filter, through the eyes of a robot. This is the real world, and you're trapped in a robot body. This then gives real motivation for you to escape, leading to the sequence we covered earlier and then having to make the decision to permanently lose some of your memories in order to get out. And then imagine this, you awake back in your room looking around in a daze. Everything seems normal, but then your vision flickers just for a moment and you see a sterile white room and an IV line in your arm and then gone. You look around and then you look at your laptop. What were you doing? Ah, oh, that's right, you were about to play that cursed game that a friend sent you. So you load back in. Now, that's all purely hypothetical. It doesn't exist. Maybe you prefer something like that, or maybe you were already happy with the current ending of the game. Either way, the reality is that the second half of the game is much less polished. I applaud it for what it attempts, but like a one-legged gymnast, it struggles to stick the landing. But I can't be too critical. Minus 256 is completely free, and only a couple of hours long. 
closer to 30 minutes if you're efficient with the tasks. It's a fun way to kill a few hours, and there is clearly a lot of love and care that has gone into this game, as is evidenced by the small details that have been included. So that's why my final rating for minus 256 is... A Duck Shrine in a Locker. Out of 10. It's surprisingly delightful and a bit funny, but you do have to question why some of those things are there in the first place. Thanks for watching. Welcome to the end of the video. This is the part where I awkwardly encourage you to like the video and subscribe for future ones. Check the description for a link to today's game as well as the ratings for every game featured so far in a fantastic handy dandy spreadsheet. Thank you for joining me on this weird gaming adventure through the depths of Steam, and until next time, take care.